Are you going to read today, Sandy, since there's so um, few? Yeah, I have the thing up online. I'll try. Um, we all just read 10, 11 minutes, then we just end a few minutes early. It'll be about 12 or 13 minutes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, you can just read whatever you want, and then, you know, we'll be done when we get done. And. There's somebody else on here. <clears throat> okay, you said it was chapter 30? 30. 30, yeah. Let me get my little book out here. Oops. Do you want to just read first, Sandy? Then you don't have to watch. Okay, deliverance? Yeah. Okay. All right, let me get over here, make sure it's on. Yes. Okay. Um, all right. <clears throat> and I doubt I'll be able to read that far. I keep having that stupid cough. <laughs> all right. And I oh somebody want to pray first? George or sure. yeah. Blessed are you, Lord, our God, creator of the universe. Thank you for this day, for the many blessings, for getting us together. Be with us. Open our minds to what we're about to read. Help us to apply it to our lives. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. All right. <clears throat> this is chapter 30, Deliverance from Assyria. In a time of grave national peril, when the host of Assyria were invading the land of Judah, and it seemed as if nothing could save Jerusalem, from the other utter destruction, Hezekiah rallied the forces of his realm to resist with unfailing courage their heathen oppressors and to trust in the power of Jehovah to deliver. Be strong and courageous, be not afraid nor dismayed for the king of Assyria, nor for all the multitude that is with him. Hezekiah exhorted the men of Judah, for there will be more of us than with them with him. With him is an arm of flesh, but with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. It is not without reason that Hezekiah could speak with certainty of the outcome. The boastful Assyrian, while used for God, used by God for a season as a rod of his anger for the punishment of the nations, was not always to prevail. Be not afraid of the Assyrian, had been the message of the Lord through Isaiah some years before to those that dwelt in Zion. For yet a very little while, and the Lord of hosts shall stir up a scourge for him according to the slaughter of Midian at the rock of Oreb. And as his rod was upon the sea, so shall he lift it up after the manner of Egypt. And it shall come to pass in that day that his burden shall be taken away from off thy shoulder and his yoke from off thy neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. In another prophetic message given in the year that King Isaiah died, the prophet had declared, the Lord of hosts has sworn, surely as I have thought, so shall it come to pass. And as I have purposed, so shall it stand, that I will break the Assyrian in my land and upon my mountains tread him underfoot. Then shall his yoke depart from off them and his burden depart from off their shoulders. You know, I have a question for you guys. Um, I hear a lot of people and they talk about the mountain and, you know, I know that daddy did and everybody talks about it being the feasts and stuff, but that's not what it always means. Right. Cause when it says upon my mountains, tread him underfoot, what are the mountains he's talking about? Do you guys well, that, that might be Mount, what he refers to as Mount Zion. Because yeah. they talked about Mount Zion being his mountain, and that, and it's uh, Is that my could, mountains with the that could that, that could have been where see. There's people that believe that the Temple of Jerusalem that was uh, kind of like on a hill, and that hill was completely removed. It's not there anymore. Okay. All right. <clears throat> All right. Let's see. Um... This is the purpose. This is the purpose that is purposed upon the whole earth. And this is the hand that is stretched out upon all the nations. 
For the Lord of hosts hath purposed, and who shall dis disannul it? And his hand is stretched out, and who shall turn it back? The power of the oppressor was to be broken, yet Hezekiah, in the earlier years of his reign, had continued to pay tribute to Assyria, in harmony with the agreement entered into by Ahaz. Meanwhile, the king had taken counsel with his princes and his mighty men, and had done everything possible for the defense of his kingdom. He had made sure of the bountiful supply of water within the walls of Jerusalem, while without the city there should be a scarcity. Also, he strengthened himself and built up all the wall that was broken and raised it up to the towers and another wall without and repaired Milo, the city of David, and made darts and shields in abundance. And he set capt captains of war over the people. Nothing had been left undone that could not that could be done in preparation for a siege. At the time of Hezekiah's ascension, accession to the throne of Judah. The Assyrians had already carried captive a large number of the children of Israel from the northern kingdom. And a few years after he had begun to reign, and while he was still strengthening his defenses of Jerusalem, the Assyrians besieged and captured Samaria and scattered the ten tribes among the many provinces of the Assyrian realm. The borders of, Je of Judah were only a few miles distant, with Jerusalem less than 50 miles away, and the rich spoils to be found within the temple would tempt the enemy to return. But the king of Judah had determined to do his part in preparing to resist the enemy and having accomplished all that human ingenuity and energy could do, he had assembled his forces and had exhorted them to be of good courage. Great is the Holy One of Israel in the midst of thee, had been the message of the prophet Isaiah to Judah. And the king with unwavering faith now declared, with us is the Lord our God to help us and to fight our battles. Nothing more quickly inspires faith than the exercise of faith. The king of Judah had prepared for the coming storm and now confident that the prophecy against the Assyrians would be fulfilled, he stayed his soul upon God and the people rested themselves upon the words of Hezekiah. What though the armies of Assyria, fresh from the conquest of the greatest nations of earth, and triumphant over Samaria in Israel, should now turn their forces against Judah? What though they should boast, as my hand hath found the kingdoms of the idols, and whose graven images did excel them of Jerusalem and Samaria, shall I not, as I have done unto Samaria and her idols, so do to Jerusalem and her idols? Judah had nothing to fear, for their trust was in Jehovah. The long-expected crisis finally came. The forces of Assyria, advancing from triumph to triumph, appeared in Judea. Confident of victory, the leaders divided their forces into two armies, one of which was to meet the Egyptian army to the southward, while the other was to besiege Jerusalem. Judah's only hope was now in God. All possible help from Egypt had been cut off, and no other nation were near to lend a friendly hand. The Assyrian officers, sure of the strength of their disciplined forces, arranged for, the conference, for a conference with the chief men of Judah, during which they insolently demanded the surrender of the city. This demand was accompanied by blasphemous revilings, revilings against the God of the Hebrews. Because of the weakness and apostasy of Israel and Judah, the name of God was no longer feared among the nations, but had become a subject for continual reproach. Speak now to Hezekiah, said Rabshakeh, one of somebody's chief officers. Thus would the king, great, thus would the great king, the king of Assyria, what confidence is this wherein thou trustest? Thou sayest, but they are not, but they are but vain words. I have counsel and strength for the war. Now on whom dost thou trust, and thou rebellest? Me, against me. The officers were conferring outside the gates of the city, but within the hearing of the sentries on the wall, and as the representatives of the Assyrian king loudly urged their proposals upon the chief men of Judah, they were requested to speak in the Syrian rather than the Jewish language, in order that those upon the wall might not have knowledge of the proceedings of the conference. Rabbi Sheka, scorning this suggestion, lifted his voice still higher and continuing to speak 
in the Jewish language said, Hear ye the words of the great king, the king of Assyria. Thus said the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you, for he shall not be able to deliver you. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will surely deliver us. This city shall not be delivered unto the hands of the king of Assyria. Okay, I'll take over. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Andy. Mm -hmm. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a, by a present, and come out to me, and eat ye every one of his vine, and every one of his fig tree, and drink ye every one the waters of his own cistern, until I come and take you away to a land like your own land, a land of corn and wine, a land of bread and vineyards. Beware, lest Hezekiah persuade you, saying, The Lord will deliver us. Has any of the gods of the nations delivered his land out of the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Hamath and Arphad? Where are the gods of Sepharvaim? And have they delivered Samaria out of my hand? Who are they among all the gods of these lands that have delivered their land out of my hand, that the Lord should deliver Jerusalem out of my hand? To these taunts, the children of Judah answered him not a word. The conference was at an end. The Jewish representatives returned to Hezekiah with their clothes rent and told him the words of Rabshakeh. The king, upon learning of the blasphemous challenge, rent his clothes and covered himself with sackcloth and went into the house of the Lord. A messenger was dispatched to Isaiah to inform him of the outcome of the conference. This day is a day of trouble and of rebuke and of blasphemy, was the word the king sent. It may be the Lord thy God will hear all the words of Rabshakeh, whom the king of Assyria, his master, has sent to reproach the living God, and will reprove the words which the Lord thy God has heard. Wherefore, lift up thy prayer for the remnant that are left. For this cause, Hezekiah the king and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Abbas, prayed and cried to heaven. God answered the prayers of his servants. To Isaiah was given the message for Hezekiah. Thus saith the Lord, be not afraid of the words which thou hast heard, with which the servants of the king of Assyria have blasphemed me. Behold, I will send a blast upon him, and he shall hear a rumor and shall return to his own land, and I will cause him to fall by the sword in his own land. The Assyrian representatives, after taking leave of the chief men of Judah, communicated direct with their king, who was with the division of his army guarding the approach from Egypt. Upon hearing the report, Sennacherib wrote letters to rail on the Lord God of Israel and to speak against him, saying, As the gods of the nations of other lands have not delivered their people out of my hand, so shall not the God of Hezekiah deliver his people out of my hand. This, the boastful threat was accompanied by the message, Let not thy God, in whom thou trustest, deceive thee, saying, Jerusalem shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Behold, thou hast heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands, by destroying them utterly, and shalt thou be delivered? Have the gods of the nations delivered them, which my fathers have destroyed, as Gozan and Haran and Rezep, and the children of Eden, which were in Thelassar? Where is the king of Hamath and the king of Arpad and the king's city of Seraphim, of Hena and of Iva? When the king of Judah received the taunting letter, he took it into the temple and spread it before the Lord and prayed with strong faith for help from heaven that the nations of earth might know that the God of the Hebrews still lived and reigned. The honor of Jehovah was at stake. He alone could deliver, could bring deliverance. O Lord God of Israel, which dwelleth between the cherubims, Hezekiah pleaded, Thou art the God, even thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heavens and earth, Lord. Bow down thine ear and hear. Open, Lord, thine eyes and see. And hear the words of Sennacherib, which had sent him to reproach the living God. Of truth, Lord, the king of Assyria has have destroyed the nations in their lands and have cast their gods into the fire. For they... They were no gods, but the work of men's hands, wood and stone. Therefore they have destroyed them. Now therefore, O Lord our God, I beseech thee, save thou us out of his hand, that all the kingdoms of the earth may know that thou art the Lord God, even thou only. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, that thou leadest Joseph like a flock. 
thou that dwelleth between the cherubims, shine forth. Before Ephraim and Benjamin and Manasseh, stir up thy strength, and come and save us. Turn us again, O God, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall sleep be saved. O Lord God of hosts, how long wilt thou be angry against the prayer of thy people? Thou feedest them with the bread of tears, and giveth them tears to drink in great measure. Thou makest us a strife unto our neighbors, and our enemies laugh among themselves. Turn us again, O God of hosts, and cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Thou hast brought a vine out of Egypt, thou hast cast out the heathen, and planted it. Thou preparest room before it, and didst cause it to take a deep root, and it filled the land. The hills were covered with the shadow of it, and the boughs thereof were like the goodly cedars. She sent out her boughs unto the sea, and her branches unto the river. Why hast thou then broken down her hedges, so that all they which pass by the way do pluck her? The boar out of the wood doth waste it, and the wild beast of the field doth devour it. Return, we beseech thee, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and behold, and visit this with mine, and the vineyard which thy right hand has planted, and the branch that thou hast made strong for thyself. Quicken us, and we will call upon thy name. Turn us again, O Lord God of hosts. Cause thy face to shine, and we shall be saved. Hezekiah's pleadings in behalf of Judah and of the honor of their supreme ruler and were in harmony with the mind of God. Solomon, in his benediction at the dedication of the temple, had prayed the Lord to maintain the cause of his people Israel at all times, as the matter shall require, that all the people of the earth may know that the Lord is God and that there is none else. Especially was the Lord to show favor when in times of war or oppression by an army, the chief men of Israel should set or enter the house of prayer and plead for deliverance. Hezekiah was not left without hope. Isaiah said to him, say, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, That which thou hast prayed to me against Sennacherib, king of Assyria, I have heard. This is the word that the Lord has spoken concerning him. The virgin, the daughter of Zion, has despised thee and laughed thee to scorn. The daughter of Jerusalem has shaken her head at thee. Whom hast thou reproached and blasphemed? And against whom hast thou exalted thy voice and lifted up thine eyes on high, even against the Holy One of Israel? By thy messengers thou hast report, reproached the Lord and hast said, With the multitude of my chariots, I am come up to the height of the mountains, to the sides of Lebanon, and will cut down the tall cedar trees thereof, and the choice firs thereof, and I will enter into the lodgings of his borders, and into the forest of his carmel. I have digged and drunk strange waters, and with the sole of my feet have I dried up all the rivers of besieged places. Hast thou not heard long ago how I have done it? and of ancient times that I have formed it, now have I brought it to pass, that thou shouldest be to lay waste fenced cities into rudious heaps. Therefore their inhabitants were of small power. They were dismayed and confounded, and they were as the grass of the field, and as the green herb, as the grass on the housetops, and as corn blasted before it to be grown up. But now thy abode and thy going out and thy coming in, and thy rage against me, because thy rage against me and thy tumult has come up into my ears, therefore will I put my hook in thy nose and my bridle in thy lips, and I will turn thee back by the way by which thou camest. The land of Judah had been laid waste by the army of occupation, but God had promised to provide miraculously for the needs of the people. To Hezekiah came the message, This shall be a sign unto thee. Ye shall eat this year such things as grow of themselves, and in the second year that which springeth of the same. And in the third year sow ye and reap and plant vineyards and eat the fruits thereof. And the remnant that is escaped of the house of Judah shall yet again take root downward and bear fruit upward. For out of Jerusalem shall go forth a remnant, and they that escape out of the Mount Zion, the zeal of the Lord of hosts shall do this. Therefore thus saith the Lord concerning the king of Assyria, he shall not come into this city, nor shoot an arrow there, nor come before it with a shield, nor cast a bank against it, 
By the way that he came, by the same he shall return, and shall not come into the city, saith the Lord. For I will defend this city to save it, for my own sake and for my servant David's sake. The very night deliverance came, the angel of the Lord went out and smote in the camp of the Assyrians a hundred fourscore and five thousand, all the mighty men of valor and the leaders and captains in the camp of the king of Assyria were slain. Tidings of this terrible judgment upon the army that had been sent to take Jerusalem soon reached Sennacherib, who was still guarding the approach to Judea from Egypt. Stricken with fear, the Assyrian king hastened to depart and returned with shame of face to his own land. But he had not long to reign. In harmony with the prophecy that had been uttered concerning his son Ned, he was assassinated by those of his own home, and Ezra Hadad, his son, reigned in his stead. The God of the Hebrews had prevailed over the proud Assyrian. The honor of Jehovah was vindicated in the eyes of the surrounding nation. In Jerusalem, the hearts of the people were filled with holy joy. Their earnest entreaties for deliverance had been mingled with confession of sin and with many tears. In their great need, they had trusted wholly in the power of God to save, and he had not failed them. Now the temple courts resounded with the songs of solemn praise. In Judah is God known, his name is great in Israel. In Salem also is his tabernacle, and his dwelling place in Zion. There break ye the arrows of the bow, the shield and the sword, and the battle. Thou art more glorious and excellent than the mountains of prey. The stout-hearted are spoiled, they have slept their sleep, and none of the men of might have found their hands. At thy rebuke, O God of Jacob, both the chariot and the horse are cast into a dead sleep. Thou, even thou, art to be feared, and who may stand in thy sight when once thou art angry? Thou didst cause judgment to be heard from heaven. The earth feared and was still. When God arose to judgment to save all the meek of the earth, surely the wrath of man shall praise thee. The remainder of wrath shalt thou restrain. Vow and pay unto the Lord your God. Let all that be round about him bring presents unto him. That ought to be feared. He shall cut off the spirit of princes. He is terrible to the kings of the earth. Okay. The rise and fall of the Assyrian Empire it's rich in lessons for the nations of earth today. Inspiration has likened the glory of Assyria at the height of her prosperity to a noble tree in the garden of Yehovah, towering above the surrounding trees. The Assyrian was a cedar in Lebanon with fair branches and with a shadowing shroud and of a high stature, and his top was among the thick boughs. Under his shadow dwelt all great nations. Thus he was fair in his greatness, in the length of his branches, for his root was by great waters. The cedars in the garden of Jehovah could not hide him. The fir trees were not like his boughs, and the chestnut trees were not like his branches. Nor any tree in the garden of Jehovah was like unto him in his beauty. All the trees of Eden that were in the garden of Jehovah envied him. But the rulers of Assyria insisted, instead of using their usual blessings for the benefit of mankind, became the scourge of many lands. Merciless, with no thought of Yehovah or their fellow man, they pursued the fixed policy of causing all nations to acknowledge the supremacy of the gods of Nineveh, whom they exalted above the Most High. Yahovah had sent Jonah to them with the message of warning, and for a season they humbled themselves before the Lord of hosts and for sought forgiveness. But soon they turned again to idol worship and the conquest of the world. The prophet Nahum, in his arrangement in, of the evildoers in Nineveh, exclaimed, Woe to the bloody city! It is full of lies and robbery. The prey departeth not, the noise of a whip and the noise of the rattling of the wheels and the prancing horses and of the jumping chariots. The horsemen lifted up both the bright sword and the glittering spear, and there is a multitude of slain. Behold, I am against thee, saith the Lord of hosts. With unerring accuracy, the infinite one still keeps account 
with the nations. While his mercy is tendered with calls to repentance, this account remains open. But when the figures reach a certain amount, which Yahweh has fixed, the ministry of his wrath begins. The account is closed. Divine patience ceases. Mercy no longer pleads in their behalf. The Yehovah is slow to anger and great in power and will not at all acquit the wicked. The Lord hath his way in the whirlwind and in the storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. He rebuketh the sea and maketh dry and drieth up all the rivers. Bashan languisheth and Carmel and the flower of Lebanon languisheth. The mountains quake at him and the hills melt and the earth is burned at his presence. Yea, the world and all that dwell therein. Who can stand before his indignation and who can abide in the fierceness of his anger? His fury is poured out like fire and the rocks are thrown down by him. It was thus that Nineveh, the rejoicing city that dwelt carelessly, that said in her heart, I am and there is none beside me, became a desolation, empty and void and waste. The dwelling of the lions and the feeding place of the young lions, where the lion, even the old lion, walked and the lions whelped, and none made them afraid. Looking forward to the time when the pride of Assyria should be brought low, Zephaniah prophesied of Nineveh. Flocks shall lie down in the midst of her. All the beasts of the nations, both the Cormont and the Bittern, shall lodge in the upper lintels of it. Their voice shall sing in the windows. Desolation shall be in the thresholds, for he shall uncover the cedar work. Great was the glory of the Assyrian realm. Great was its downfall. The prophet Ezekiel, carrying farther the figure of a noble cedar tree, plainly foretold the fall of Assyria because of its pride and cruelty. He declared, Thus saith the Lord God, He has shot up his top among the thick boughs, and his heart is lifted up in its height. I have therefore delivered him into the hand of the mighty one of the heathen. He shall surely deal with him. I have driven him out for his wickedness. And strangers, the terrible of the nations, have cut him off and have left him. Upon the mountains and in all the valleys, his branches are fallen. And his boughs are broken by all the rivers of the land. And all the people of the earth are gone down from his shadow and have left him. Upon his ruin shall all the fowls of the heavens remain, and all the beasts of the field shall be upon his branches, to the end that none of all the trees by the waters exalt themselves for their height. Thus saith the Lord Jehovah, In the day when he went down to the grave, I caused a mourning. And all the trees of the field fainted for him. I made the nations to shake at the sound of his fall. The pride of Assyria and its fall are to serve as an object lesson to the end of time. Of the nations of earth today who in arrogance and pride array themselves against him. Yahweh inquires, to whom art thou thus like in glory? and in greatness among the trees of Eden. Yet shall thou be brought down with the trees of Eden into the nether parts of the earth. The Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knoweth them that trust in him. But with an overrunning flood, he will make an utter end of all who endeavor to exalt themselves above the Most High. The pride of Assyria shall be brought down, and the scepter of Egypt shall depart away. This is true not only of the nations that arrayed themselves against Jehovah in ancient times, but also of nations today 
who fail of fulfilling the divine purpose. In the day of final awards, when the righteous judge of all the earth shall sift the nations, and those that have kept the truth shall be permitted to enter the city of Yahovah, heaven's arches will ring with the triumphant songs of the redeemed. Ye shall have a song, the prophet declares, as in the night when a holy solemnity is kept, and gladness of heart, as when one goeth with a pipe to come into the mountain of the Lord, to the mighty one of Israel, and the Lord shall cause his glorious voice to be heard. Through the voice of the Lord shall the Assyrian be beaten down, which smote with a rod, and in every place where the ground staff shall pass, which the Lord shall lay upon him, it shall be with tabrets and harps. Uh, Keith, I guess. Chapter 31, Hope for the Heathen. Throughout his ministry, I, Isaiah bore the plain testimony concerning God's purpose for the heathen. Other prophets had made mention of the divine plan, but their language was not always understood. To Israel, it was given to make very plain to Judah the truth that among the Israel of God were to be numbered. Many were not to be descendants of Abraham after the flesh. This teaching was not in harmony with the theology of his age, yet he fiercely proclaimed the messages given him of God and brought hope to many a longing heart, rejoicing out after the spiritual blessings promised to the seed of Abraham. The apostle to the Gentiles in his letter to the believers of Rome calls attention to this characteristic of Isaiah's teaching. Isaiah is very bold, Paul declares, and saith, I was found of them that sought me not. I was made manifest unto them that askest not after me. Of the Israelites seem unable, to, uh, unable or unwilling to understand God's purpose for the heathen, yet it, was very, yet it was this very purpose that made them a separate people and had established them as an independent nation among the nations of the earth. Abraham, their father, to whom the covenant promises was first given, had been called to go forth from his kindred to the regions beyond that he might be a light bearer to the heathen. Although the promise to him included a pros posterity as numerous as the sand of the sea, yet was not for selfish purposes that he was to become the founder of a great nation in the land of Canaan. God's covenant with him, oh shoot, lost my place. Which paragraph was I at? The end of often. You're about a third way down the page on 368. God's covenant with him embraced all the nations of the earth near the end of the paragraph. Well, which, which paragraph, what's it started with? Often the Israelites. Often the Israelites. Oh, there it is. Often the Israelites seen unable or unwilling to understand God's purpose for the heathen, yet it was this very purpose that had made them a separate people. Wait, wait just a minute. You've lost me because we're... Okay. You're, you're you down two-thirds of the way down in, in that the paragraph. paragraph. Keith, start with God's covenant with him. Near the end of the paragraph. God's covenant with him embraced all the nations of oh, earth okay. there. Yes. Yeah. I will bless thee. Jehovah declared, and make thy name great, and thou will be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. When I put the little arrow in there, I was above it, so I dropped the whole page. Oh, gosh. <laughs> in the renewal of the covenant, shortly before the birth of Isaac, God's purpose for mankind was made again made plain. All the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him was the assurance of the Lord concerning the child of promise. 
And later the heavenly visitant once more declared, and thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed. The all embracing terms of this covenant were familiar to Abraham's children and to his children's children. It was in order that the Israelites might be a blessing to the nations and that God's name might be made known throughout all the earth, that they were delivered from Egyptian bondage. If obedient to his requirements, they were to be placed far in advance to other peoples in wisdom and understanding. But this supremacy was to be reached and maintained only in order that through them, the purpose of God for all nations of the earth might be fulfilled. The marvelous providences connected with Israel's deliverance from Egyptian bondage and with their occupancy of the promised land led many of the heathen to recognize the God of Israel as a supreme leader. The Egyptians shall know had been the promise that I am the Lord when I stretch my, forth my hand upon Egypt and bring the, out the children of Israel from among them. Even proud Pharaoh was constrained to acknowledge Jehovah's power. Go serve the Lord, he urged Moses and Aaron, and bless me also. The advancing host of Israel found that knowledge of the mighty works, workings of the of the God of the Hebrews had gone before them, and that some among the heathen were learning that he alone was the true God. In wicked Jericho, the testimony of the heathen woman was, the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and in earth beneath. The knowledge of Jehovah that had thus come to her <coughs> proved her salvation. By faith, Rehab perished not with them that believed not. And her conversion was not an isolated case of God's mercy towards the idolaters who acknowledge his divine authority. In the midst of the land, a, a numerous people, the Gibeonites, renounced their heathenism and united with Israel, sharing in the blessings of the covenant. No distinction on account of nationality, race, or caste is recognized by God. He is a maker of all mankind. All men are of one family by creation, and all are one through redemption. Christ came to demolish the wall of partition, to throw open every compartment of the temple courts, that every soul may have free access to God. His love is so broad, so deep, so full, that it penetrates everywhere. It lifts out of Satan's influence those who have been deluded by his deceptions and places them within reach of the throne of God, the throne encircled by the rainbow of promise. In Christ, there is, no, there is neither Jew nor Greek, bond or free. In the years that followed the occupation of the promised land, the beneficent designs of Jehovah for the salvation of the heathen were almost wholly lost sight of and it became necessary for him to set forth his plan anew. All the ends of the world, the psalmist was inspired to sing, shall remember and turn into the Lord, and all the kindreds of the nations shall worship before thee. Princes shall come out of Egypt. Ethiopia shall soon stretch out her hand unto God. The heathen shall fear the name of the Lord, and all the kings of the earth, thy glory, this shall be written for the generations to come, and the people which shall be created shall praise the Lord. For he hath looked down from the height of his sanctuary. From heaven did the Lord behold the earth to hear the groaning of the prisoner, to loose those that are appointed to death, to declare the name of the Lord in Zion and his praise to Jerusalem when the people are gathered together and the kingdoms to serve the Lord. Had Israel been true to her trust, all the nations of earth would have shared in her blessings. But the hearts of those to whom have been entrusted a knowledge of saving truth were untouched by the needs of those around, around them. As God's purpose was lost sight of, 
the heathen came to be looked upon as beyond the pale of his mercy. The light of truth was withheld and darkness prevailed. The nations were overspread with the veil of ignorance. The love of God was little known. Air and superstition flourished. Such was the prospect that greeted Isaiah when he was called to the prophetic ministry. Yet he was not discouraged, for ringing in his ears was a triumphal chorus of the angels surrounding the throne of God. The whole earth is full of his glory, and his faith is, was strengthened by visions of glorious conquest by the church of God. When the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea, the face of the covering cast over all people, and the veil that has spread over all nations was finding to be destroyed. The Spirit of God was to be poured out upon all flesh. Those who hunger and thirst after righteousness were to be numbered among the Israel of God. They shall spring up as among the grass, as willows by the watercourses, said the prophet. One shall say, I am the Lord's, and another shall call himself by the name of Jacob, and another shall subscribe with his hand unto the Lord and surname himself by the name of Israel. To the prophet was given revelation of the benefit design of God in scattering impenitent Judah among the nations of the earth. The people shall know my name, the Lord declared. They shall know that they shall know in that day that I am he that doeth speak, that does speak. And not only were they themselves to learn the lesson of obedience and trust in their places of exile, they were also to impart to others a knowledge of the living God. Many from among the sons of strangers that were to learn the love of him as a creator and their redeemer, they were to begin the observance of his holy Sabbath day as a memorial of his creative power. And when he should make bare his holy arm in the eyes of all nations to deliver his people from captivity, all the ends of the earth should see the salvation of God. Many of these converts from heathenism would wish to unite themselves fully with the Israelites and accompany them on the return journey to Judea. None of those were to say, the Lord hath utterly separated me from his people. For the word of God through his prophet to those who should yield themselves to him and observe his law was that they should thenceforth be numbered upon spiritual Israel, his church on earth. Okay, Marty, you can take us to the end of the chapter. The sons of the stranger that joined themselves to the Lord to serve him and to love the name of the Lord to be his servants, every one that keepeth the Sabbath from polluting it and taketh hold of my covenant, even them will I bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices shall be accepted upon mine altar, for mine house shall be called a house of prayer for all people. The Lord God, which gathereth the outcast of Israel, saith, Yet will I gather them gather others to him beside those that are gathered unto him the prophet was permitted to look down the centuries to the time of the advent of the promised messiah at first he beheld only trouble and darkness dimness of anguish many who were longing to longing for the light of truth went were being led astray by false teachers into the bewildering mazes of philosophy and spiritism. Others were placing their trust in a form of godliness, but were not bringing true holiness unto, his, unto the life practice. The outlook seemed hopeless, but soon the scene changed, and before the eyes of the prophet was spread a wondrous vision. He saw the son of righteousness arise with healing in his wings and lost in admiration, he exclaimed, the dimness shall not be such as was in her vexation when at the first he 
lightly afflicted the land of Zebulon and the land of Naphtali, and afterwards did more graciously affect her by the way of the sea beyond Jordan in, in Galilee of the nations. The people that walked in darkness have been seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death upon them hath the light shined. This glorious light of the world was to bring salvation to every nation, kindred tongue and people. Of the work before him, the prophet heard the eternal father declare, it is a light thing that thou shouldest be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved of Israel. I will also give thee for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. In an acceptable time have I heard thee, and in the day of salvation have I helped thee, and I will preserve thee and give thee for a covenant of the people to establish the earth to come to inherit the desolate heritages that thou mayest say to the prisoners. Go forth to them that are in darkness. Show yourselves. Behold, these shall come from afar, and lo, these from the north and from the west, and these from the land of Sinem. Looking on still further through the ages, the prophet beheld the literal fulfillment of, those glor of these glorious promises. He saw the bearers of the glad tidings of salvation going to the ends of the earth to every kindred and people. He heard the Lord saying of the gospel church, Behold, I will extend peace to her like a river and the glory of the Gentiles like a flowing stream. And he heard the commission, Enlarge the place of thy tent and let them stretch forth the curtains of thine inhabitant in thy habitations. Spare not, lengthen thy cords, and strengthen thy stakes, for thou shalt break forth on the right hand and on the left, and thy seed shall inherit the Gentiles. Jehovah declared to the prophet that he would send his witnesses unto the nations to Tarshish, Pool, and Lud, to Tubal and Javan, and to the isles afar off. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publishes peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, thy God reigneth. The prophet heard the voice of God calling his church to her appointed work, that the way might be prepared for the ushering in of his everlasting kingdom. The message was unmistakably plain. Arise, shine, for thy light is come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon thee. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and gross darkness the people. But the Lord shall arise upon thee, and his glory shall be seen upon thee, and the Gentiles shall come to thy light, and the kings to the brightness of thy rising." Lift up thine eyes round about and see all they gather themselves together. They come to thee. The sun shall come from afar and thy daughters shall be nursed at thy side. And the sons of strangers shall build up thy walls and their king shall minister unto thee for my wrath, which I smote thee. But in my favor have I had mercy on thee. Therefore, thy gates shall be open continually. They shall not be shut day nor night, that men may bring unto thee the forces of the Gentiles, and that their kings may be brought. Look unto me, and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God, and there is none else. Uh, Marty, hold on just a minute. Um, Violet joined us. Do you know where we are, Violet? Would you like to? Yes. Read? You can finish that chapter if you like. Okay. These prophecies of a great spiritual awakening as a time of gross darkness are today meeting fulfillment in the advancing lines of mission stations 
that are reaching out into the benighted regions of Earth. The groups of missionaries and heathen lands have been likened by the prophet to Ensign set up for the guidance of those who are looking for the light of truth. In that day, says Isaiah, there shall be a root of Jesse, which shall stand for an ensign of the people. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. And it shall come to pass in that day that the Lord shall set his hand again a second time to recover the remnant of his people. And he shall set up an ensign for the nations, and shall assemble the outcast of Israel, and gather together the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. The day of deliverance is at hand. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose heart is perfect toward him. Among all nations, kingdoms, and tongues, he sees men and women who are praying for light and knowledge. Their souls are unsatisfied. Long have they fed on ashes. The enemy of all righteousness has turned them aside, and they grope as blind men. But they are honest in heart and desire to learn a better way. Although in the depths of heathenism, with no knowledge of the written law of God nor of his son Jesus, they have revealed in manifold ways the working of a divine power on mind and character. At times, those who have no knowledge of God, aside from that which they have received under the operations of the divine grace, have been kind to his servants, protecting them at the risk of their own lives. The Holy Spirit is implanting the grace of Christ in the heart of, of many a noble, noble seeker after truth, quickening his sympathies contrary to his nature, contrary to his former education. The light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world is shining in his soul. And this light, if heeded, will guide his feet to the kingdom of God. The prophet Micah said, when I sit in darkness, the Lord shall be a light unto me. He will bring me forth to the light, and I shall behold his righteousness. Heaven's plan of salvation is broad enough to embrace the whole world. God longs to breathe into prostate human humanity the breath of life, and he will not per per permit any soul to be disappointed who is sincere in his longing for something higher and nobler than anything the world can offer. Certainly he is sending his angels to those who, while surrounded by circumstances, the most discouraging, pray and face for some power higher than themselves to take possession of them and bring deliverance and peace. In various ways, God will reveal himself to them and will place them in touch with providences that will establish their confidence in the one who has given himself a ransom for all, that they might set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments. Shall the prey be taken from the mighty or the lawful captive delivered? Thus saith the Lord, even the captives of the mighty shall be taken away and the prey of the terrible shall be delivered. They shall be greatly ashamed that trust in graven images that say to the molten images, ye are our gods. Happy is he that hath the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Turn you to the stronghold, ye prisoners of hope. Unto all the honest in heart in heathen lands, the upright in the sight of heaven, there arises light in the darkness. God hath spoken. I will bring the blind by a way that they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. That was good. <sighs> you know he's there and the world is getting so, so ugly. Oh, yes. So many people have no idea. You see all the things going on in the world and it's so sad for some of those people that think that's the only way uh, 
I'm glad Hello, you were here, Violet. How are you doing? Doing pretty good. I was absorbed in a book and I completely forgot the time. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that, made the head there. Become, that made the head become the tail because you're generally your first tonight. You were last. <laughs> I think she's the 11th right. hour servant. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> there you go. All right. Well, does somebody want to have closing prayer? <laughs> Violet. Okay. Our precious Heavenly Father, how I praise you, dear Lord, how I worship thee. And Lord, I thank you for the blessings you have given us. Thank you for this opportunity to meet together like this. And, and pray, Lord, that you will be with each one of us. Keep us walking in the right way. Keep us close to you and protect us. Dear Lord, be with us through this night and until we meet again on Sabbath. In Yeshua's precious name I pray. Amen. Yeah. And thank you. And again, everybody, remember Dave in prayer. I he's I don't know if it's the flu. I don't know what he has, but he wasn't feeling real good and went to the doctor for tests. So well, and we know Dave, if he's gone to the doctor for tests, he must not be feeling too good because he usually doesn't. Well, no, I'm fine. But so well, anyway, well, it was nice to see everybody. And yes. uh, this uh, Sabbath is the fourth already. And we have Hein and Keith. Yes. So it'd be a good one. I have written down. All right. And you try and get ready for something in three weeks, Miss Marty. I'm trying. <laughs> and Marty, or Marty, Barbara and George, you guys stay warm. Oh, yeah. 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 It's going to warm up. Yeah. Right. Oh, it does. Yeah. <laughs> as long right. as we got wood, that's all that matters. The house is toasty. <laughs> <laughs>